Hi everybody, my name's Jamie and today I'm going to talk about the additional news that we've been given for Assassin's Creed Valhalla over the past week or so. There isn't a lot of news out there for the game at the moment, so I'm lumping quite a few things into this video, not all of which are directly related to the game. Uh, first up, we have a few dev Q&A videos from the Assassin's Creed Twitter account. Uh, I'll provide links to all of these in the description. The first one of these videos was with Ashraf Ismail, and he talks about how Eivor is going to have a hood and cloak, just like protagonists in older AC games. Furthermore, these can be toggled on or off, as they even have a stealth value in the game. Social stealth was a big part of older AC games. If guards found you to be suspicious, or you needed to enter a restricted area, you could hide in a group of people. This element didn't make it into later games, and it sort of felt like the AC identity was lost a bit because of that. I'm glad to see it coming back. Uh, the second video was also with Ashraf, and in it he talked about the flighting competitions, which are basically Viking rap battles. Flighting was actually something that both the Norse and the Saxon people did at the time that AC Valhalla is set. It was something to do basically while sat around in a mead hall or a pub. Um, you'd all be drinking and then one person would rhythmically insult the other just for the cheer of the crowd. Apparently there's a saga written about how Odin destroyed Thor in a flighting competition, but I haven't checked into exactly what that is yet. If you'd like to know more about that saga specifically, just mention it in the comments and I'll do a dedicated video on it. Ashraf says that the team wanted to use flighting competitions because they're fun, and they're part of the culture at this time on both sides. From the sounds of it, Eivor can challenge someone to a competition, or be challenged themselves. It's a little awkward, but Ashraf also kind of explains how the system will work. Eivor will be insulted, and then we'll have a bunch of choices in front of us to pick from. If we get the right one, the battle will go on. It sounds like the rhythm of how the words are said in each phrase is intrinsically linked with the correct choices, so we'll need to talk them through in our heads before choosing them. Ashraf ends by saying that we'll get a little bit of something out of completing flighting competitions, but he doesn't come out and say what that is. If I had to guess, I'd say we'll gain renown as a good flighting competitor and maybe unlock new opponents around the world. I also think that we'll have better choices for the competitions based on the experiences we've had in the game, so exploration is going to be key. I'll explore flighting competitions in a separate video a bit more, um, and then present some theories about how I think they might work. For now, that's all Ashraf had to say. The third video I wanted to talk about features Darby McDevitt. He talked about a really interesting subject, how strong characterization for Eivor will be achieved regardless of gender. Since we can play Eivor as a male or female character, the story needs to be written a certain way. Apparently the writing team put a lot of time thinking into that very concept before the game was even made. They set out to write a coherent character with a coherent personality and then discussed how other role-playing games do that. Darby said that there are two routes to go down. The first is to have a character that is built by the choices you make as you make them and the second is to create a character with a distinct personality and choices will be based on that character's personality rather than your or who you perceive that character to be. This opens up the character to be a lot deeper. For example, if you were making choices for the character, you could either choose to call someone out on a lie or not. When a character is written for the game, you can now choose to ignore the lie, call the person out, or withhold your knowledge of it in the hopes of learning more. Eivor is the latter of these two systems, a coherent character written for the coherent world, and this story in particular. Darby says that the reason for this is that by the end of the game, regardless of the forks you've chosen along the way, you'll always feel like you were playing Eivor and not some other character. Darby ended by saying that there's a lot of cool mystery around Eivor, and they can't wait for us to dive into that mystery. This is actually the first time I've heard about Eivor being more complex than we'd first thought, and I'm really excited to get into that when we finally play the game. Finally, there was a fourth video. This actually popped up later in the week and I nearly missed it. The one that I'm talking about here stars Darby as well, and he's talking about the reason for Eivor having the wrist blade on top of his arm instead of under it. Essentially, this is all to do with honour. Vikings valued honour over most things, even punishment. If you were a Viking and someone insulted you, you'd probably kill that person unless you settled the argument. As long as you owned up to and accepted that you'd killed that person, you wouldn't be punished for it. Vikings basically like everyone to know who they've killed. With the wrist blade being mounted on top of Eivor's arm, they can show off their skills in style and make sure that everybody knows who they've killed with that hidden blade. 
I'm really into this. It's a nice twist on a classic Assassin's Creed weapon, but it's been made to fit with the culture that the game is set in, and I think it's only going to be better because of that. Moving on from the official news to some other AC stuff, there's an Assassin's Creed historical tabletop board game available for pre-order right now. I haven't dived into this at all, but there is a lot to it. It's from Triton Noir, who I'll leave a, a link to in the description below, but if you want to know more and want me to get into the details of this game, just let me know in the comments. Next, Access the Animus has had a tool developed that helps you choose which order you should consume AC content in. Um, I used to replay every game before the next big release, something that I'm trying to do now, or at least work out how to do before AC Valhalla launches, but this would be great for anyone who wants to play the games in a fresh new way. I think I'll do a separate video of me going through this for my results. Uh, I apologise if that's already gone up on the channel. So watch out for that, otherwise it's linked below. Go absolutely nuts. One tiny point that I feel like I should mention just because it's AC related, there's a new character coming to the mobile game AC Rebellion. Her name is Aya of Alexandria and she'll be available from the 3rd of June via the Helix Rift event The Mask of Ibis. Now I think it's time to address the elephant in the Assassin's Creed room, that news about collectibles and side missions in AC1. This story was misreported in a couple of places due to press outlets just not reading tweets correctly, so I'm taking this straight from the horse's mouth. That horse is Charles Randall, a former Ubisoft developer who worked as AI lead on AC1. The story he shared was prompted by something that was going around on Twitter, basically asking for a horror story in five words. His five words were, the CEO's kid played it. He then added that the following story is 100% true and the craziest five days of his life. The story focuses on AC1. We know that, but specifically it's about the side missions with the targets. In addition to the targets, there were also a bunch of side activities, um, except those side activities weren't in the original game. At least they weren't in the first build. At the point that the team were good to go and ready to ship the code and have it burned onto discs, some news came in that the CEO's kid played the game and they think that it's boring and there's nothing to do. The CEO of Ubisoft is Yves Guillermo, but whether it was his kid, I'm not exactly sure, so we don't actually have a year reference for this. Take it with a pinch of salt, but it might have been his kid. Anyway, Randall's lead then comes to him and says, so we have to add a bunch of side activities into the game. We have a plan from Patrice, but I'm not going to say yes until you are in. Randall then goes off to listen to music and crash at his desk. The reason for that crash is the part he missed out. The lead also said that we have to pull all these side missions into the game in five days, and they have to be bug free because the build will be going and burned onto discs directly for retail, which sounds mental. Randall eventually comes around and says yes, but he has conditions. At this point, any condition was okay by his lead, so he got his wish. He doesn't outline what that wish was, but says that he and four or five others ended up in the main conference building of Montreal's Peck building. Normally, this building is only accessible via a keycard, and it was just them who had access. They had all of their computers, and they blitzed the work in those five days. I guess what he wanted was a safe space for them to work without anyone bothering them. I used to work in programming and the bosses would always come over at the worst moment and ask you to do some menial task, so I can understand the desire for this wish. Randall doesn't remember much of those five days, but he knows it went well. They got everything done during the five days and he knows that about the only bug that made it through. Anyone who ever tried to get the full 1000 gamer points for AC1 might have encountered an issue that prevented them from completing all the Templar assassinations. As it turns out, one of these Templars was parented to the wrong sector. Approaching the Templar from the wrong direction caused him to fall through the world and despawn instead of die. This stored him as dead without crediting you for the kill and prevented you from ever getting the full completion. Parenting is encoding when uh, an element is related to another element that sort of spans a larger part of the game. So I guess the Templars would be linked to enemies or and then there'd be a specific enemy type for the Templars. So maybe that Templar in particular was created or the other Templars were created as side mission Templars and it was incorrectly assigned to a different type of enemy which would be why it fell through the world. I'm really guessing with my basic knowledge of coding here, but I think that would be it. Considering this is the only bug to make it out, that's pretty good going. Randall even says that it's a miracle that the code didn't melt our consoles. 
He also admits that the bug for two assassins spawning, if you had two controllers attached to the console at the time, was probably his fault, but he's not sure. Looking back, he says that he should have just asked for lots of money instead of a sealed room. To be honest, having been through Crunch, I'd stick with the sealed room every time. Randall then seemed to get a lot of people confused commenting on the thread, so he cleared a few things up. First, he believes that the content that was added was both good and necessary. We've never seen that first build of the game, and probably never will. It's probably sat in a GitHub server somewhere on the internet, and will never see the light of day. I would be incredibly interested to see just how sparse the content is without those added side activities. Second, he says that everyone volunteered to do those five days of crunch, all because they loved the game. Third, he says that AC1 was the easiest game he's ever launched and had the least overtime involved with it. I find that astounding. The other developers in the room were, and I apologise for butchering your names, Chris Whaler, Phil Michaud and Sasha Filtovsky, and apparently they all had a great time. Regardless of the reason, they were all passionate enough to put the work in, and that's what matters. Randall added that he doesn't know for sure that this work was the result of the CEO's kid playing the first build. He only knows what he was told, so it could have come from anywhere. What matters is that the higher-ups said it, and that meant that the changes had to be made. Interestingly, no new art for the side activities was made. They just used what they had. I guess with five days you don't have time for designers to faff around. Apparently, Templars were already in the game, so they just fluffed some more spawns and added them to gameplay elements. Flags were also already in the game, so I guess they just added a billion more. The final point that Randall makes is that this story of a last minute change is totally normal for games development. He says that any developer will confirm this, and I'll add that any coder will confirm this as well. He says that the only reason that this is notable is because he started it with a funny story, and reiterates that any developer will have a similar one. The last point on that matter that Randall made was to assure that every single press person that he's deleting their emails. I didn't send him one, but if you watch this Randall, I'd love to talk to you about that first build. I don't think anyone wants to crap on it, I just want to understand what the world was like without these side activities. I think it's so interesting to know that that existed at some point. Anyway, that's it for this video. Ashraf Ismail did a Q&A with the Washington Post launcher, but I wanted to cover any news or details from that in a specific AC Valhalla video later on. Once again, if you've got any particular subjects you'd like me to dive into, just let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.